it was interesting to see the two of them as a student because uh, Weinberg is very much about what's the general thing you can do, and Polchinski is very much a what's the simplest uh, example I can think of which captures the physics I'm trying to do, and he kind of thinks that through, and 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 it's a very interesting juxtaposition to see them uh, interact with each other. So welcome to FEMATH's podcast. Today, our guest is Dr. Cliff Burgess. Uh, he uh, is a faculty member at McMaster University in Ontario, Canada. Uh, you did your PhD from uh, University of Austin, uh, sorry, University of uh, Austin, Texas. And your advisor was uh, Dr. Steven Weinberg, who is a well-known physicist. Then you did your postdoc from IES Princeton. And right now you are also a, a faculty member at the Perimeter Institute. The list of the you know the uh, the fields in which you work is quite long, so I'm just going to mention some of them. So it's quantum gravity, effective field theories, dark matter, string theory, model building, and cosmology, to name a few. And you have also written two uh, textbooks on physics. One of them is uh, on a up on a primer of standard model that came out in 2007. And my favorite book actually is the other one is on effective field <laughs> theories. Uh, that you wrote in on in 2021. So, so uh, first of all, uh, welcome to the podcast. Uh, so uh, the first question that I want to ask you is that um, you did your PhD under Steven Weinberg. So how how was Weinberg as an advisor? Uh, well, first, uh, thank you for the invitation to come. I'm uh, great to be here. Um, no problem. He was, you know, he was a you know, he was very, he was very inspirational in the sense that he had this vision of physics. Very broad prison of physics, which he conveyed uh, in particularly in his courses. He was uh, he taught when I was there the field theory course on which his later you know, his, his textbook series was based, and uh, I think actually his lectures were um, better for a beginner than the book is in the sense that his book doesn't have a lot of the handshakes that you normally have. I'm about to do this, and this is why it's important that he would actually say in class, and so. Um, that was very, very uh, probably one of a kind class of lectures to take. It was a two year series of lectures, which is longer than normal. But he was also a busy guy. So it wasn't like you could go into him and say, Steve, look, how do I do this integral? <laughs> but um, what he did was he adopted the Harvard, um, you know, he had just come from Harvard and, and he adopted the Harvard uh, system where uh, every week the group would come in. Uh, to his office, and somebody would give a presentation of their research, and we'd all be sitting around the office, usually having a brown bag lunch of some sort. And uh, in that, and then that everybody was kind of expected to say to make a presentation every term, and that included the students. So it was kind of a good a good experience to kind of a bit daunting, but a good experience to explain what you're doing, even if it wasn't finished, to a bunch of people who were very knowledgeable. And what was one of the things I admired about Weinberg was that he was unlike I've seen a number of big shot physicists in that kind of a setting, and it's very easy to get uh, very negative, saying, "Oh, this isn't important. You know, why are you working on this?" He he was always very good at. Uh, sometimes you'd be there, and there's some some talk. It was really turgid. You couldn't understand anything. And he what he would do is he would say, "So what you're saying is," and then he'd summarize it in about two sentences. And then, then everybody in the room said, oh, that's what they were doing. <laughs> and then he'd ask a very you know insightful question. And so the, from that point of view, it was kind of a, a very much of a uh, moving the, the ball forward kind of an attitude as opposed to a, an ego thing, which is very uh, inspirational to see in somebody like that who could very well have afforded to have a lot of ego. <laughs> right. And the time at, uh, you know, at which you did your PhD was around the time when he got the Nobel Prize. So that might have boosted the egos of some people. But did you see such a thing in Weinberg? No, he yeah, he got the prize in 79. And yeah. I was, uh, I graduated in, uh, from medicine in my undergraduate degree in 1980. So I had heard about him. Uh, and I had heard it turns out I was I got a, when I was shopping around for universities, I got a phone call from John Wheeler, who was also at Texas, a recruitment call, and he said that Weinberg was coming to to Texas, and that was part of the draw of being there. So he, when he arrived, he was the big star who was just arriving. He just got the Nobel Prize, and and uh, they they made a big deal about him. But and and you know he 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 certainly knew his worth. It wasn't like he was a, a wallflower by any stretch. But he was in, a, you know, at the time on that floor, on the ninth floor in the in the physics building, 
uh, you know, John Wheeler was, uh, had an office, uh, Weinberg had an office, Bryce DeWitt was there and Cecile DeWitt was there. Uh, Claudio Teitelboim at the time was there, now Boonster, um, Richard Matzer. It was kind of a gravity, it was a building that had a lot of gravity, uh, people, Dwayne Dykus was there. And then soon after he came, Weinberg hired uh, Willie Fischler and Joe Polchinski. And so it was a mix of particle physics and gravity and, and, and kind of in those days, you could very easily be a particle physicist and not know any gravity at all. And that changed right around then with the advent, I mean, the string theory became a, a, made a big dent in, in, uh, in, in the way we think about particle physics. And the geometrical tools that they used became just part of the lingua franca. And so it was an advantage to be a student there where the particle and the, and the, and the relativity communities were kind of talking to each other and, and uh, all teaching courses and, and uh, having seminars. So it was kind of a, it was easy to grow up familiar with both relativity and particle physics issues. And, and, and there are a lot of people there that had uh, big reputations. So, uh, you know, he wasn't like, it wasn't like he's Weinberg towered over everybody else. So it was, it was, uh, that probably helped. Right. Uh, there is one observation that I made and it made me a bit surprised. So I don't know if I should be surprised because I don't know, you know, the culture of, you know, uh, the academia of physics at that time. Uh, the observation is that you have no paper with Weinberg. So oh, yeah, how do you right. yeah. explain that? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I was his first student there and right after, so I, I was a, a, a I did my qualifying exam with Philip Candelas, who was, I should have mentioned him. He was also uh, mm -hmm. on site there at the time and uh, did a project on supersymmetry based on uh, Weinberg's course. But then Weinberg uh, asked me, you know, he kind of asked if I was interested to be a student. So I, I, uh, I, 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 I switched to, to him and then I met him and he said, well, you know, why don't we come and meet and talk about what your thesis will be on? And, and I said, no, no, Steve. Uh, why don't I go see if I can find my own problem, and and uh, that's probably it'd be good for me to do. And and so and so, so he said fine. <laughs> and then he he walked across the room, uh, right across the hall to Joe Licken, who was a postdoc at the time, and they wrote these classic Paul Licken Weinberg papers on on supergravity as the uh, as the mediator of supersymmetry breaking. Uh, and so it clearly at the time, in retrospect, he was looking for somebody to help him with the supergravity calculations and. And and as an, a complete idiot, I I, I turned him down. <laughs> and so, and then after that, you know, I don't think he ever offered a problem to anybody else at Texas. I think it was one of those things where he just kind of, you you kind of in this group, this milieu, you're kind of uh, meeting every week with everybody, and you're talking to the postdocs. And you know, Andy Albert was there at the time, and and so there was a lots of lots of ways in which you could start collaborations um, in that group. Uh, and he moved right. to that mode, I think. Uh, so I think I dropped the ball on that one. <laughs> So there's one more thing about Weinberg, and that's something that I want to talk about. Uh, and I want to ask you that if you find any problem with that. So, uh, okay, so I've, I never met Weinberg. The only communication that I had with him was a single email because I read his book and I sent him an email thanking to write that book, Dreams of Final Theory. Um, uh, yes. But one thing about Weinberg's book that I think many physicists agree on is that his notation is very weird. And have you found that problem with Weinberg? In your no, I, uh, I, I, I grew up with his notation. The, I, his notation is my oh, notation. Okay. I think it's the best notation there is. <laughs> okay, that's you know, right. For, an, an example of that is is people often complain about the, his spinner notation, but but his attitude, the way he taught supersymmetry and field theory, was that why would you learn a different different way of doing spinners just for supersymmetry? You should just do what you do when you're doing quantum electrodynamics, and so he just taught it all that way. <laughs> and so right. there's a lot. To, it's not just a lot of advantages to it. <laughs> I mean, it's not just notation. For example, um, you know, the ubiquitous uh, metric in QFT is the mostly negative metric, but he uses the mostly positive metric in QFT as well. I, so I disagree with that. It, the, the, the ubiquitous one is the mostly positive one, and then there's, there's some particle physicists who don't use it. <laughs> well, okay, interesting, because I think most of the QFT textbooks, I mean, in string theory, the ubiquitous That's one true. is most, the, mostly the positive. Textbooks. Yeah. Uh, but I think the particle physics, so, I think specifically particle physics textbooks, it used to be, they used to call it the West Coast metric because it, Bjorken and Drill, and then later on, um, Peskin and Schroeder were two very influential textbooks for particle physicists that used the wrong metric. And then, and then, but all the relativistic, the relativity books, like Mr. Thorne and Wheeler and Weinberg's earlier gravity book, they right. all use the mostly positive one. 
And so they used to call that the East Coast metric because it was the one that was used, you know, in Harvard and, and Princeton and places. And so it used to be true. And all the relativists, when I when I learned uh, gravity in Texas, they were all using the mostly positive one. So it was just the phenomenologists who kind of learned physics through those influential textbooks that that uh, use mostly negative. And I think probably that's grown because as people have kind of switched from phenomenology and they've done now they do some gravity. Now there's a gravity community and a string community that uses the wrong metric too. But uh <laughs> wrong. okay i i think uh um one of the reasons why uh, you know the, that people give when they when you are when you ask them that why you, do you use the mostly negative metric is that uh, they say that we want the momentum square to be m squared <laughs> we won't, don't want it to be m p squared equal to negative m squared i don't know is that a good if that is a good reason or not but this is That's... some of the reason that some of the people give that's a terrible reason again that, and the reason is, the reason is that the in the end of the day it doesn't matter if p squared is if it time like vectors are negative or not. What really matters is if you wick rotate, if, if you're doing finite temperature right. field theory or anything like that, then your time is going to change sign and then you're mostly negative. And what you really want you to do is your notation should be your friend. And if you have squares of in of, of you know same sign signature metrics which are negative, you'll never find sign mistakes. And so it's a that's a very bizarre choice. I think wick rotation is the killer argument for uh for using the mostly positive one. But it's in the end of the day, I think it's true that people use what they learned, and it's probably right that you, once you've chosen a side, stick to it, <laughs> and and never right. never read, never try and copy formulas from somebody else who's using the other conventions. Derive all all your 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 results in your own conventions, write them down as a reference, and then just stick to it. I mean, uh, for example, I uh, had a, a great, great problem in this because my go-to book for quantum field theory was Peskin and Schroeder. I learned all of my quantum field theory for Peskin and Schroeder. But when I switched, when I went to string theory, I mean, almost everyone was using mostly positive. So most of the formulas I had to rederive just for, and not just for, because that was the thing that I wanted to work on. So uh, for string theory, I had to derive a lot of formulas. Okay, so uh, you you said that uh, uh, Weinberg asked, uh, said to you that, you know, we can work on a problem and you said that i will you will find your own uh, you know problem to work on so how did you choose the topic of your phd i you know i kind of was talking to a lot of people and i don't think i chose a very good topic i think it was uh i was I, my thesis was on supersymmetry breaking in in anti desitter space which kind of sounds actually more, top, more topical now than it was uh, at the time uh and it was there were uh, some influential people who had been calculating uh what they said were weird things in anti de Sitter space, uh, which seemed to say that supersymmetry is breaking, and they were essentially making a mistake in how they did calculations in anti de Sitter space. And so my thesis was more or less fixing those mistakes. And so I think probably, you know, my mom read it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so it, it wasn't that that uh, that useful a choice. So I think it was just a mistake not to have I uh, accepted accepted the guidance of uh, of people. But it's true that uh, with Probably more useful were the papers that we started before I graduated that weren't in my thesis. Uh, you know, with Fernando Caveda was a sat, was shared. I shared an office with him. He was a student, and uh, Anna Maria Font as well. And we started. You know, the, 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 the people were talking about the the low energy limit of string theory and and how do you derive the four dimensional Lagrangian for it. And there's actually a preprint that went around from Witten's that never got published, which was claim was that you cannot write it in a standard supergravity form in terms of a superpotential and a Kähler potential because of the anti-symmetric tensors. And I think people, he figured out what was wrong with that before it became a paper. But before he did, the preprint was circulated. So I have somewhere in my office uh, that that preprint. And so um, with Anna Maria and Fernando, you know, we started to try and just see what symmetry arguments you can use to write down this Lagrangian. And it turns out we right. did it in parallel with uh, with a you know, very well-known paper, Witten's. And of course, there I mean, were many things that we just missed, <laughs> which would have been very interesting to do. Uh, but we were I mean, doing sometimes, it with faculty. <laughs> I mean, sometimes these unpublished preprints can be very, very influential. For example, uh, my first PhD project, I mean, wh whose paper is going to come in some months, I think, uh, was some, on something called free down states in, uh, you know, uh, in the free boson conformal field theories. And these Friedan states, they were originated from an unpublished note by Dan Friedan. Yes. That note was unpublished, but I think it, you know, gave rise to this whole set of states in conformal field theory. So sometimes these unpublished notes can be very, very influential. Um, there was yeah. one question that I want to ask is that um, uh, when you're doing research, there are some instances where um, 
you realize that there is something that you don't know, although you have been working on that thing for a long time. But sometimes, not always, but sometimes it uh, it turns out that this this thing that you don't know is something that nobody knows, right? Uh, but sometimes it turns out that no, okay, actually you don't know this, but other other people know this. So as a as a PhD student, do you have any method of figuring out that what you don't know is something that nobody knows, or is it, is this something that uh, you know only you don't know? Some other people may know it. Because, for That's example, if you are in question. a university like, yeah, for example, if you are in a university like Harvard or Princeton, then it may be easier because you have access to people like, you know, who, who are the biggest experts of the field. But so for someone who is not in such universities, what can that person do? I mean, uh, you it's have hard, internet, but it's not easy. Right? It's hard. It's, it's easier now than it was because of the internet. That's true that that, that the literature is easier to access than it, it was. But it's basically, that's a very difficult thing for a student to do. And, uh, and I think it's probably true that that uh, for me, when I was when I was learning things, I was uh, I was surrounded by experts, so you could just ask them, and and that that continued. So I was kind of the last generation who could afford, you know, who in particle physics who didn't know any string theory when I graduated. And but in my postdoc, I was learning string theory, but I was learning it, you know, in Princeton where everybody was doing it, and it, and it was. Uh, and they were the experts, and, and and nobody knew anything essentially in in particle physics about string theory, except for a very few people. And, but there, the, those people were around, so you could just ask them, and it was uh, it was daunting to do. But uh, if you don't have that, it's it's a it's a very difficult thing to do. It, it's uh, you know, it's it's uh, there's I don't think there's a magic bullet. All you can really do is is be on top of the literature and and maximize your uh, your your ability your your options your opportunities to speak to people that are experts and then they normally will just tell you. And I, I remember having a conversation where we when we were learning how to do we was so, we were trying to understand how to do um, open superstrings uh, in the using the Polyakov approach when I was a postdoc and um, with this is with Tim Morris who was an office mate of mine and we we kind of knew just enough math to hurt ourselves because. We knew that uh, some of the world sheets that you would have were, were not orientable, uh, like the Klein bottle or the you know things like that. And uh, we knew that there was an obstruction to having spinners on non-orientable world sheets. And so we were kind of puzzled as to how you could do uh, superstrings on a on a for open superstrings. And the basic resolution to that came talking to uh, Witten at lunch. I think it was uh, we asked him. That question, and he answered. He kind of gave us a bundle answer. So it was uh, a, 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 what we call a bundle, bundle boy answer, and and it was clear from you know the blankness of our expressions, I guess, that we didn't understand what we what he said. So then he kind of you could just almost see him mentally rewind, <laughs> and then then he gave a physics explanation, which was just crystal clear. And basically, the statement was that the the, the not being orientable means that you you know you're you're interested in in the action of parity on your spinners. And because you're you're when you when you think of a, an unorientable system, a surface as being projection of a you know you can think of it as being a projection of an orientable one, where you're projecting out by parity essentially, uh, then it matters how parity acts on your spinners. And and so his point was that if you have one spinner, you can't represent parity with it. But if you have two, you can. <laughs> and so okay, so the thing great. is that you know even even numbers of spinners you can do, and that's kind of why you can do superstrings. And that Stiefel Whitney obstruction was really about that. Uh, and so, so that was an example where we could have wasted an enor enormous amount of time trying to understand what was going on there. Whereas the the basic um, point was a very simple one. <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, isn't it isn't this a bit bit easier to see that you can do two spinners because uh, you can bosonize them into a boson? I don't know if that that makes sense or not. I it, probably it does. It, it's it's one of those things that once you see it, there's many ways to see it. <laughs> but, but yeah, 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 sure, you know, sure. I agree, I agree. Our our ignorance was deeper than that. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. Uh, okay, well, one thing that I wanted to ask is that so uh, you have uh, you know written a whole book on effective field theories, and you are you know a very big proponent of effective field theories. Uh, another person who I uh, in my uh, you know according to what I know, who was one of the biggest proponents of effective field theories was your advisor Weinberg. So do you think that uh, you have inherited his enthusiasm for effective field theories? Well, very, or did it come from so. somewhere I, else? No, it was very much... Uh, I can remember in his when he was teaching field theory, he kind of... It, it, he didn't teach it as a topic. It was just kind of... That was just the way he thought about field theory. And I remember him giving a... a 
And it actually was a bad thing, I think, at some level to have learned it from him, because for him, it was stuff that he had thought through in the 60s. And so, and, and this is, I was learning from him in the early 80s. So he, he had been familiar with it for a long time. He wrote this very classic article in 1979 on phenomenological Lagrangians, which is more or less lays out what the program is and kind of show, mentions in that, that uh, he kind of talks about it in the context of what Pions, which is where he learned it. But he kind of also talks about how the same thing would work for gravity. And whenever he did work with gravity, he kind of talked about it that way. Um, and so I remember it was an epiphany moment for me when, because I mean, all of a sudden renormalization and, and all that stuff that seems bizarre about field theory made complete sense. And, and so that was a, made a huge impression on me. But the bad thing was that I had thought that it was the opposite of, of the question you asked before. It was, I had thought that this is one of those things that everybody knows. <laughs> And and I didn't realize that it was basically Weinberg knew it and a small circle around him and it was kind of in a slowly growing circle. And so I remember the, there's a classic paper on chiral perturbation theory by Gasser and Leutfeller that came out in the early 80s. And I remember when I saw the preprint thinking, well, this will get rejected because everybody knows this. <laughs> but you know what they had done, though, they, they had taken the words of uh, Weinberg's um, Physica article, uh, the, the phenomenological engine, and they had actually done it. They'd kind of done the, the loop corrections and they'd done a careful job of it. And that would have been a perfect problem for a student. And so there were a variety of questions like that that were effective field theory being applied to the first, for the first time beyond the kind of the simplest thing, which if we as students in Texas had known that they were not widely known, we would have been on we would have been all over those <laughs> because <laughs> there's a whole bunch of calculations you could do which which uh, which were uh, easier to do, and we we didn't realize that everybody didn't know that that's how you do them. So it was kind of a one of those things where that that question of, of what the field knows as opposed to what you know cuts both ways <laughs> it turns out right i mean correct me if i'm wrong but i think most of the one loop calculations have been done by Pauli in the 30s and therefore what, I, what i'm thinking is that uh I'm, I'm not about super gravity but i think most of the uh you know quantum mechanical calculations at one loop level have been done by Pauli in the 30s um is that so which ones do you mean you, you mean like quantum electrodynamics yeah, quantum electrodynamics. I mean, not not for the theories that came after uh, he uh, he died, uh, but uh, the thing is that uh, because one loop calculations seem easier, then it can give you the impression that okay, this is something that everybody knows. This is what I'm trying to say. Well, I think the the loops, the 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 way loops, yeah, he did calculations very early, as did many of them, but none of them believed anything because of all the divergences, and so it wasn't really until the Feynman Schwinger relativistic framework uh, came around that people became uh, confident that they, they actually understood what they were doing. So I think that uh, Pauli, although he was doing things very early, um, as were others at the time, because you, you could do old-fashioned perturbation theory with, with electromagnetism, mm -hmm. and, and that's what he was doing, and, and many of them were doing. But the thing is, everything was diverging all over the place, and it was hard to see how to handle them because the not having manifest covariance made it difficult to disentangle the, how the divergences meshed with the parameters you had in your theory. Right. So I think the real the real loop calculations, were they, the ones that were important uh, and were influential, were the ones like at the Shelter Island Conference where they decided where you know, where Beta calculated the lamp shift or estimated the lamp shift, and and got the right mm, ballpark. Yeah. That that kind of thing I think was where that, that I would I would say that's kind of really where it starts. <laughs> Right. So uh, I have a friend and he uh, was a cosmologist and he used to work on, well, he was a cosmologist because now he has switched fields. Now he works on interpretations of quantum mechanics. So uh, he used to work on effective field theories of gravity. And he introduced me the, because, okay, so before meeting him, I didn't know about, uh, didn't know about this work, but he introduced me to the work of uh, John Ahoy uh, about the John, you know, effective field. John, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right, right. So on effective field theories of gravity. And when I, uh, you know, uh, studied his work, it seemed to be a seemed to me as a very beautiful piece of work and a very influential work. So, what do you think about his uh, the influence of his work on the status of status of effective field theories of gravity? I think it's it's super influential. I think, and and that's that's an exa another example of a calculation that uh, I wish I'd known hadn't been done as a student. I kind of uh, <laughs> that's a kind of a great great calculation, and I think he had the vision to actually do it as opposed to say this is how it can be done. He just did it. And and he kind of picked out the what were the important observables in that case the non analytic things uh, so that so you didn't rather than focusing on what gets renormalized and what doesn't he kind of picked out the things that were the absolute predictions of the theory and I know he told me that uh, once that he gave a talk on that 
in the early days after he had done it in the 90s at Boulder. And it happened that Weinberg was visiting Boulder. <laughs> and so <laughs> Weinberg was in the audience and Weinberg kind of said, you know, I did, didn't realize it was going to be that easy. <laughs> so, so, so yeah, I think it was all to John's credit that he kind of really, he, he kind of said, well, enough talk, let's do it. And he, and he calculated the right things and it all works the way it's supposed to work. But he kind of, the, his doing it and showing without a doubt that it works was hugely influential because then it's, it's one thing for particle physics to say, oh yeah, you're supposed to do it this way. It's another thing for somebody to actually calculate something that hasn't been calculated before and say, right. even though you're not going to measure this, there was no problem with divergences in this particular thing. And and then that and he's continuing to do that. So it's, I think that's a, a very influential line of of, of 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 research. And you can kind of see that the, the the news has gotten into the gravity community in a way that it hadn't before him. So I think he really moved that uh, he carried the ball way forward <laughs> in that case. Right. Uh, that actually reminds me of something else. And correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, according to what I know, um, there are a lot of uh, proposed mechanisms, uh, mainly coming from the West Coast, on how to get a uh, de-sitter in string theory, but nobody actually does it. So what do you think that, uh, can you actually get de-sitter from string theory or no? Almost, there's, there's a very nice quote by Witten in his, uh, he summarized Polchinski's uh, research. And one of the last papers Polchinski wrote was on this subject. And, and, and he has this nice sentence where he says, uh, he says, uh, so Polchinski, you know, looked at the various criticisms and and uh, and shows that it it almost certainly works, and and then he puts in brackets as the is a consensus in the community, essentially. So I think we hear, I think in 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 uh, in the in social media that it's a that most people don't think you can get to sitter space but i think if you talk to the string theorists most you, you said it was west coast for example i think it's true that the people in in stanford were instrumental in pushing this stuff forward yeah. but if you go to it's not an east coast west coast thing i think you go to princeton <laughs> you know most of the people in princeton <laughs> agree that it, that it's uh, the, you know, they're, they're not working on it but i think that they find the arguments that uh, polchinski's arguments to be convincing and and that's not to say that the people criticizing the sitter space constructions are not saying anything i think they're the people are making a when you can try and construct an explicit solution that's not supersymmetric in string theory, there's a lot of approximations you have to make, and they're harder to control because it's not supersymmetric. So it's difficult. And it's good that people are are kind of putting their fingers on the on the weak links to try and improve them. But if you kind of ask uh, from that, do you draw the conclusion that so people have, you know the this this the level of rigor is not complete yet? which I think is the right way to think about it, that almost certainly the sitter solutions are there. There's going to be many, many solutions. The landscape is, is this picture of the landscape, I think was very intuitive even in the eighties. But um, there's a kind of a subgroup now, which is I think much more localized than you're making it sound uh, based in Boston and in Europe uh, who are uh, very vocal about, they have a belief that you can, it's not that people haven't succeeded yet, but that it can't be done. And I think, they may be right, but it's the evidence for it is not there yet. So I think that uh, I have very little doubt that there will be the the the, the constructions that the, that there will be decider solutions, uh, and they'll be more and more convincing as time goes on. And I think the the obstruction that what makes it difficult is everybody is perturbing around a supersymmetric solution, and those solutions have to be anti decider. So you're trying to get to a positive cosmological constant from something that starts off as negative. And that makes mm -hmm. it hard because you're, you're, it's hard to yeah. make it uh, make everything perturbative. I think the 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 way that will probably be the most successful uh, is to perturb around the flat solutions because then going up and down is equally easy. Uh, and I think that's more difficult to do. Uh, and and the right. tools that have been developed for finding all the solutions uh, are not as well uh, set up for those. But that's probably the the framework which will make the sitter space the the the, the obstruction to the sitter space. The, the the least, you know, I kind of say that from an effective field theory point of view, that's that's it's really clear that that's what you have to do, but that leaves open the embedding into string theory, which is what the real issue is that people are arguing about: is can you make a string construction that does what these effective field theories do? And I think that's an open question. But I I right. I my prior on the, how it will be resolved <laughs> is not uh, that it'll just be there's a minority in the West Coast that are believers and everyone else doesn't think it's going to happen. I think. My prior is that 
the evidence is that there's no re there's no compelling reason that it won't happen. Although there's a lot of interesting points that have been raised by people who are criticizing the explicit constructions, which understanding those is actually very valuable. And so, so it's it's useful that people do that. But it does not nothing yet has undermined my sense that these solutions will exist. Well, uh, I say when I when I said it's West Coast, I don't know the present demographic. Now it may be much more distributed, <laughs> but I think it it was West Coast at one time. I think in probably in early two thousands, because for example, you have KTLT I, coming from West Coast. I mean, for, for example, Abbott Silverstein yeah. is a big proponent of getting this well, That's true. Theory. The construction yeah. started from the West Coast. I'm not I'm not denying that. That's actually very that's true. That, that's where they came from. Uh, you know, Maldasena was involved too, so I think it was kind of a Princeton West Coast thing. Okay, but it, uh, but it, I think that the, the the existence of the solutions, nobody's been in doubt. The the constructing of them is much harder, and that's kind of the work that came mm -hmm. out of those groups. Right, and since I uh, talk to the people who are mostly on East Coast, so there is a bias, East Coast bias as well. So they, that may be one of the things because these stories have been told to me by people on the East right. Coast. That's one of but the. But when you say East Coast, do you mean Boston or do you mean Princeton? <laughs> Boston. Well, uh, so I have I've talked to people who have are who have came from Harvard or came from uh, you know not Princeton. Well, okay, uh, one professor in my group is from Princeton. He did a postdoc from Princeton. So, but he says the same thing, <laughs> right? My, my 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 experience has been that the the group in Boston, which is the most vocal, thinks they call it a West Coast East Coast thing. But for them, Princeton is on the West Coast. <laughs> because most of the people in Princeton, as I understand it, are not, uh, you know, I don't see the same, uh, the same, a lot of a lot of the critics are in Princeton, right? It's, uh, it's, it's uh, so I, I, my, my picture on it is that the the people who believe, really believe that there's no decider space, is a, they're a, a minority, I think. Uh, okay. okay. It's it's an act very active, I think the, the whole Swampland direction is a very active line of research. But I'm mm -hmm. not yet convinced by it. It's uh, the evidence for it. I think is pretty weak, and so we'll see what happens. <laughs> okay, yeah, we'll see what happens. Okay, so uh, I think you uh, you mentioned uh, in one of your interviews that uh, you used to think that modifying gravity may be the better thing to do uh, as compared to dark energy and dark uh, you know matter. Is that true? I think everybody has that point of view because you see at some point, you know, you see that you have two things: dark matter and dark energy that are that are only inferred, their existence is inferred using gravity, but you need two things and it's most of what's out there, not just a little bit, you know, then, then you think, well, well, if we're using gravity to infer their existence, maybe we're getting the gravity wrong. It's a super attractive, you know, the economy of that is very attractive. So I think everybody who kind of starts thinking about that looks at it because it's, it's, if, it, if true, that would be, that sounds like that's, that's, that would be a, a, the simpler and the beautiful way to go. But what what in the end of the day the and it may yet be what happens you know who knows, but the if you kind of ask what's the you, as a researcher you're always balancing where do I think the useful clues are and what do I work on, but you have to also say well at at this time what's the preponderance of evidence, and so this applies equally well to dark energy and dark matter as it does for example to the swampland you know I I personally don't see that the the swampland for example or modified gravity as being likely to be the where things go and so i don't work on them so much but that doesn't and and, and that's partly because the I, i'm thinking that right now the preponderance of evidence really doesn't point in those directions but that doesn't mean that they're wrong or that the current preponderance of evidence will be the future preponderance of evidence so it's it's one of those things where uh you have to kind of make a judgment call but right now i would say that the uh, for the dark energy dark matter dark matter in particular the the what's what's special about those things you know the, re the reason you believe that they're at all is that there's a there's a redundancy in the evidence for them and i and the analogy i like to make is with with atoms in the turn of the 20th century that when it became compelling that that matter was made out of atoms well before you could see them and what made it compelling was that there was many lines of evidence for them uh and there were people who resisted it who kind of said that no that's you, you, you we're never going to see them that that's not really physics that's kind of that's all um, that's all mathematics. But what made people in the end of the day uh, convinced that atoms were there was that you could infer their properties in many different ways that didn't have to be related to one another. And if atoms didn't exist, shouldn't be giving you the same answers. But they did. And so well before you saw them, people were were were, were, were certain that they were there. And I think dark matter and dark energy are very much like that. The, the more evidence you have for it, the more different independent lines of evidence, the harder it is to evade mm -hmm. the conclusion that it's there. And that's, for me, what kills the modified gravity program is that the 
there are modified gravities that do good jobs of specific kinds of evidence for dark matter. For example, you know, MOND is a is a modified Newtonian dynamics is a proposal which does a great job of describing rotation curves of galaxies. I think you have to give them that that they they have a uh, you know that's it's a very pretty picture, but it doesn't apply to clusters of galaxies or to cosmology or to the, you know, the there's a many lines of evidence and it's not accounting for them all. Whereas a particle candidate for dark matter gets them all right, and it's actually easy to do. Not it's not theoretically difficult. So that just smells right. <laughs> the problem is that there's a wide variety of parameters, and and you'd like to really prove that it's right. And only some of the parameter space is accessible. So there's a long, you know, as you know, there's a there's an ongoing uh, research effort to try and fill in the parameter space, which is useful, but might fail. But even if it fails, it, that's not going to they're not they're never going to be able to exhaust all the parameter space. I don't think so. It's going to be a the worst case scenario is that we never compellingly find out where, you know where it lives. But the even if that happens, I think the evidence that it's there is going to still be very strong. Right. Just because there's so many lines of evidence that converge on, on dark matter. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, one of the things that uh, I was surprised to learn from one of your interviews uh, was that, uh, so we do know that there have been many proponents of, uh, many candidates of dark matter over the years. Uh, for example, we had these WIMPs, we had axions. Uh, for example, take axion. Axion can be seen as, uh, you know, the goldstone boson of a particular symmetry. Uh, but in one of your in one of, in one of your interviews, I came across this uh, concept that uh, there are two kinds of goldstone bosons. One of them are something called the compact goldstone bosons, and the other ones are called, uh, you know, for example, dilatons that come from, you know, the breaking of scale scale symmetries. And you made this remark that, uh, you know, the investigations into the role of diliton for things like inflation have not been studied in very detail. Is that true still? It's less true now than it was, but I, I think it's true that if you the m many more, there's much more thought that has gone into axions as now. Now we're talking about inflation as opposed to dark matter. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for for dark, but it's probably the same statement applies to dark matter. But it's uh, for inflation. I think it's true that uh, the, as a particle physicist, one of the things that you see is is that the one of the problems is why is this degree of freedom so light? It has to be light in order to roll around during cosmology and do what inflation is supposed to do. And it's hard, notoriously hard to get scalar fields to be light uh, in the presence of quantum corrections. And so one attitude is to just ignore the quantum corrections. And that's that's usually the, 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 the gravity community comes from that side because quantum corrections are small. And so you're normally thinking that the, 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 the corrections will be small. And so you're not worried about what they do for scalars. But there are times when the quantum corrections aren't small. And this is one of them. And so... The, from particle physics point of view, the, one of the things you're trying to ask is, why is it true that there's a slight scalar there at all? And then a Goldstone boson or a pseudo Goldstone boson is, a, is the natural go-to place. And then the trigonometric one, where it's a compact symmetry, is what has been most explored. Uh, the the uh, I think the thing that that um, probably for me it's more of a lament rather than <laughs> yeah I. I think that uh, if you kind of ask where Goldstone bosons come from, um, from microscopic physics, th again, that's been thought through more carefully for the for the axion type Goldstone bosons, just because it, that's um, uh, an easier. It's, it's kind of a more of a generic thing that 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 uh, people have a lot of intuition for how that behaves, but I think that the the um, there are lots of diliton sources. Uh, of pseudo goldstone bosons that can be applied to inflation and and what's i think the thing that hasn't been emphasized enough is that the data prefers the dilettons that the the data the observational data for inflation can distinguish not in great detail but in, in it can distinguish categories of um of models of inflation and the goldstone boson the axion ones don't do a very good they're not the best fit they they they, they and there's a kind of a two observables that you compare as you know there's the um, there's there's the spectral tilts of the fluctuations we see in the microwave background, which is something which is a, a little bit different from one, but not uh, but but not uh, a lot by you know, it's like 0. 0.96 or something like that. So it's uh, but then there's uh, also the ratio of the tensor to scalar 
um, perturbations. And they, until the tensors are seen, that's consistent with zero. But then the question is, how close to zero is it? So there's always some dome that uh, the observers present for where you have to live. And if you kind of then as you vary the parameters, the model is going to move around on that plane. And the ones for axions aren't very close to the dome. You know, they kind of cut the edge of the dome, but they're they're not ideal. Whereas the ones mm -hmm. for the 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 dilettons, they go right in the middle of the dome. They're kind of the ones that are at one point. Um, uh, Jérôme Martin and uh, Vincent Venet did a Bayesian comparison of the various inflationary models, and the ones that won essentially were the were the exponential potentials, which are the ones that come from the dilettons. People. Appreciate that, but the way they say it is kind of a, a to me a funny thing. What people will say is that there are specific models like Higgs inflation or Starobinsky inflation that are um, kind of they're phrased in a funny way from an effective field theory point of view. Uh, involve they, they've involved they say curvature squared terms in the action, and it turns out that th those things are all expressible as uh, exponential potentials, as are mm -hmm. uh, you know dilaton potentials. And and so the the family of those potentials is the one that the data is pointing towards. And the fact that there are specific examples along that way that are specific models people had in the past may or may not be informative. You know, the, the, we're not likely to guess the exact theory of the world just by looking at the, the, that sparse data. But the pattern that they're all kind of in this strip that is exactly where inflation wants to be is suggestive to me. And so I think that uh, if you come in with a prior that you that you're looking for a Goldstone boson. And there's these two categories, and then you look at the prior that it should agree with the data, and and if the if the whole parameter space agrees, that's a better thing than having it just corners of a degree, then that that points you towards uh, these dilettons, and right. so I think it's probably true that they they haven't got the attention they deserved given how well they do given uh, for, with, with those motivations. I mean, uh, if you're working on string theory, then we do know that uh, these axions and dilettons they do come in pairs, so. If you're working on string theory, then at least even if they were not, uh, even if they, even if we didn't did not know that, how are they, you know, doing with the data thing? Even then, it should be studied at least, right? Uh, but uh, yes, is there any obstruction to their study? Well, why do you think that they have not been studied? Is there some obstruction or is there some difficulty? They have been studied. Them? You know, that's I, that's how I found them is that we were built we were trying to build models of uh, in string theory, and and so if you look at a radion, the, the, if you kind of do a uh, just generically, if you look at what a kind of potential a radion gives you, it tends to give you these potentials because the canonically normalized version of the field is the logarithm of the radius, and so it comes to you as an exponential potential. I see. But the, I think the the, the problem that, that you're up against are the problems that everybody's up against in Sitter space that you, that you're trying to find. Uh, so, so the, the, I think the best kind of the, the one with the best stringy provenance is probably the fiber inflation models, which are, they they are built in the large volume scenario. Kind of string vacua, but the criticisms that people have of the sitter space in string theory apply there too. And I think it's probably true that there is an additional criticism there that the KKLT constructions do not have. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think something which is probably also completely uh, something which is resolvable. I don't think it's a it's a killer objection, but it's. So I, I would say that that those so it depends now on what your standards are. If you if you're if you're happy if you're happy with the effective field theory arguments at the level of KKLT, then they exist, and fiber inflation is an example of it. But uh, if your uh, your standard is you don't think that that any of these things have passed the bar that you think is the level of rigor needed to show they're in string theory, then that obstruction is the same for all of them. Essentially, it's not special about the axion or the dilaton. I see. Okay, so uh, in, in the start of this podcast, I mentioned some of the fields in which you have worked. Uh, one of the things that I did not mention is the is quantum Hall effect. You have also worked there. Uh, so my question is that how do you change fields? It's it's a hard thing to do. Well, okay, so first of all, uh, if you don't have tenure, it's hard to change field. That I know. But uh, you, you got your first... <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, right. It's a bitter truth, but it's true. Uh, but the thing is that uh, you got your first position after your first postdoc, right? So it yes. was a bit easier. But even even if you have tenure, uh, it can be a bit difficult to change fields. So are there any, any tips that you want to give uh, to you know younger researchers for changing fields? Uh, again, that's a, that's a good question, and it's not easy. Uh, and it, mostly people follow their interests. And, 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 it, and it's true what you said about Job security is a huge piece of that. You, you you have to be productive, and it's difficult to change fields and not be productive for the length of time you would need to to change fields and still get a job. That's I think it's hard to get around that. 
But people who I know who have successfully done that are often at places where, for example, um, Shosheng Zhang was was a, a very he was a particle physicist who became a, a very successful condensed matter physicist. Fortunately, he recently passed away. Uh, so he was in Stanford for a long time, but he was a postdoc in, in Santa Barbara where you had a very strong string and a very strong particle group and they were, could talk to each other because they had a common language. And I think that actually helped him a lot because you could come in on one side and you could then learn how to talk to the other side because often it's most of it, most of the problem is a language problem. So I think, first of all, you have to have the interest, right? If you're not interested, then there's no reason why you have to do that. But if you mm. are interested, then it's uh, it helps to have people around who can, uh, you have the same problem in a new field as you had in your own field as you're learning. You know, what do I know? What is it? The diff what are the things I don't know? What are the things that nobody knows? And you have to have people who are expert to give you advice on that. In my case, the quantum hall thing was really, I would say I, I didn't change fields. I was kind of more of a drive-by <laughs> in the sense that uh, yeah, yeah. I had I had a friend uh, who was on the particle physics side who made this observation, a very nice observation, I think. Uh, so this is Graham Ross and Andy Lutkin. Um, and they made this observation that people on the quantum hall side, the quantum hall effects are it's, it's very cool, right? There, there's a lot of amazing physics that goes on and you have these quantized conductivities you know, to, to, to fantastic accuracy and set to the, to the level where they were at one point used as the standard for measuring the fine structure constant. And you think, well, why, how can theory possibly predict things that accurately? Well, there's a lot of interesting theoretical questions there. And people were doing uh, interesting measurements too, that they they were finding these super universalities that the, the, the various ex exponents that they would measure in transitions between the different quantum hall plateaus, they all had a, they all had the same value. And there was a, and so, so uh, Lutkin and Ross made this observation that the that the uh, that just they at the level the of symmetry. Uh, well, yeah, they they kind of made this level that the this, this, this people had made pictures of of uh, if you plot on the conductivity plane where you plot the Hall conductivity across the bottom and the ohmic conductivity on the vertical axis. So you're kind of living in the top half of the plane because the ohmic conductivity is always positive. The various critical points. Where are points on that plane, and the plateaus are on the along the bottom, where the the ohmic resistance is zero, and then the the uh, the relationship amongst these these these, these various uh, critical points, and and oh, an, an experimental fact is that if you if you kind of go from one quantum hall state to another one, and you plot what the conductivity does in between, it it follows this beautiful semicircle. Uh, it's a semicircle which starts at one plateau, ends at the other plateau, and it has a center on the on the axis. And all those kind of semicircular look liking things and the critical points on those semicircles, they they just look very much like the pictures that people would draw of modular symmetries in string theory. Yeah. And so so they they can make the observation, well, maybe there's a connection there. And then at the same time, a condensed matter group involving Xiao Chen Zhang again made a similar observation. And I happened to be talking to both of them. And so so the the, the only paper, so I, I was not only involved in trying to flesh out the observation. On the particle physics side, that these symmetries are sufficient to predict the various observ observables that people measure. That that, that the, many of the things that they're finding, if you had the symmetry, you know, you would automatically get these 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 wonderful these wonder, you'd explain these wonderful measurements that they'd done. But the problem always had been that. Oh, I, I guess also in the early days, I remember talking to. Uh, because of the connection to the particle physicists that were thinking about it, I had met Xiao Sheng, and and he was talking about the, he had this he had I don't know if you've heard about the SO five theory of superconductivity, uh, but he had kind of a a, a picture where, where the the, the superconductor high, high DC superconductors had a they had an anti ferromagnetic order and then they have a superconducting order. If you plot the uh, temperature against doping plane, there's different domains and and they, there's but there's a juxtaposition of those two orderings. So he tried to phrase that in a very simple way in which you have SO3 is the symmetry that's broken by an anti-ferromagnet because it's just a direction in space. And SO, SO2 is like U1, that's the, the symmetry that breaks into electromagnetism. He tried to make a simple a theory that would describe uh, the, the co competition between the ordering of those two things as in a, in a kind of very much like a grand unified way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, as he was describing that, uh, thinking, well, what you do in that kind of situation is you you write down the you know the effective field theory what the Golston bosons are doing because all you need to know is the symmetry breaking pattern for that and so I said I told him you should do that when you're <laughs> when you make this proposal and he didn't 
And so we wrote a paper where we did it, but it was, it's kind of, so that's the level at which it was a drive by. It's kind of things that uh, making an observation, but other people are really pushing things forward in a, within their fields. And I think the only thing that's happened since then that I think is exciting still, but probably uh, I haven't pursued myself is that nobody, I think the reason that whole line of thought died is that there was no example of a, of a, the, the symmetry that you're talking about in that case is not easy to, to identify for the electrons. If you kind of look at the system and ask, what are the electrons doing? It's hard to see where the symmetry comes from. So there's no kind of model of the quantum Hall system where that symmetry was kind of uh, built in from the get-go. And and so one of the nice things was that in the, there was a time when people were looking at ADS CFT correspondence and um, applying it to condensed matter systems. It turns out that in those systems, there's a very uh, simple way in which the symmetry can emerge. And so it kind of became irresistible to try and make a model that had the symmetry to see if you could have a, a an archetype of a candidate for um, for a quantum Hall system that could be one in which the symmetry gets a lot of things right, but then you can make more detailed predictions. Uh, and I think that that program failed in the end of the day, not for want not not decisively, but I think the example we found I think has flaws, and so it, it can't be there. It's not the right example. And I think the main thing that's missing is how to include disorder in those kind of theoretical frameworks. But I still think that's probably a, a, the way in which quantum Hall systems might be thought about in the future. That's That might be the most fruitful way in which you can use ADS-CFT language to make mm -hmm. contact with observations on the condensed matter side, although it's completely an unrealized hope in the sense that I don't think anybody has uh, made that work or even pushed it. Right. Okay, so I think uh, I have lots of questions, but we uh, only have half an hour. So I think let me just run through some of the questions that I have. So you have uh, written two textbooks, and uh, I am quite interested in people's experience in writing textbooks. For example, um, uh, some months ago, I uh, you know uh, you know talked to D Daniel Schroeder on Twitter, uh, and he uh, uh, he actually mentioned this thing that uh, when Peskin had this idea of writing this book on quantum field theory. Peskin approached Schroeder and he said to him that, well, this book will take one year, uh, but that book ended up taking five <laughs> years, <laughs> right? And yeah. I have some other accounts of authors. For example, there is this book on quantum optics by um, Scully and Zuberi. So the, yeah. the, the Zuberi person is from Pakistan, the country where I come from. So I talked to him and he said the same thing. He said that, uh, well, we thought that we will end that book, uh, finish that book in 1993, but they, they, it, 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 uh, it ended in 1997. So it takes a long time. So yeah. did the similar did a similar thing happen in your case? That yes, the book yes, absolutely. much longer. Okay, interesting. It's, it's like the, it's, that's the joke. It's the joke that uh, we don't do things because they're easy. We do them because we, we think they will be easy. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. for me, what's happened with these with these books is that is that the they, they they come out of lecture notes. I like to kind of write lecture notes because my writing is really bad, but I can type fast, and so I like to typeset. My lecture notes so i can then read them the next time i teach the class and then once you've got them you might as well share them with the students and the great thing about that is that they find errors and so they debug them uh and so it's kind of a it builds up uh uh it's easy to to repeat a course if you've got better notes and so but after a while in the standard model i used to teach the it used to be true that back in the day people I, mostly the people in the audience were experimentalists and they they didn't really want to have all the fancy theory stuff they wanted to have kind of the tree level standard model basically um, and they came to me from a course that was taught by a guy who's since retired, which was essentially relativistic quantum mechanics. So it wasn't really a proper field theory course. So it, so I, I had to kind of use this course as a vehicle to teach quantum field theory at the same time as teaching the standard model. And it worked pretty well, I think. I think the, the people, you know, they, they seem to be able to calculate tree graphs at the end. Um, but then once you're lecture, your, your notes are kind of 80% uh, done, that's when it's tempting to to make a book out of it. And so, so Guy Moore joined, joined me for that. And uh, he, and he did the QCD part, which was the part that I was, it was not my expertise and he was much better at it than I was. And it's true that that I didn't think it was gonna take us very long to do that last part, uh, but it took, it, the, the notes had been developed over probably 10 years, but then the final thing where we decided to make a book out of it, I thought was gonna take a year and it probably took more like five, like you said. The last stuff is also it's also soul destroying in the sense. Well, you know, it's not like you're doing it full time and that's all you're doing, right? You're kind of doing mm -hmm. it as well. You're yeah. doing other things, and so, and so the um, the last things are always joyless as well. It's like things like indices and 
problem sets and oh, yeah. and and uh, you know that that kind of stuff is not much fun to do. So it that takes you don't give it as much time as it probably deserves. The effective field theory book was one that I was different in the sense that that, that unlike the the standard model, the notes were more or less written before we approached the publisher. But when we finished the standard model book, I, I proposed to them an effective field theory book because it seemed like there was no good book in that area, particularly one mm. that kind of expressed the unity of how it, it affects many fields of physics. And so they, 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 you know, to their credit, they kind of said, yeah, yeah, do it. But then I was on the hook because, because I promised them I was going to do it and it, none of it had been written. And I had taught some courses where I made notes, but they were kind of in patches. And so there was much more of a a requirement to write the material, which meant involved learning material, because some some of these areas I, I'm not very familiar in, um, and that again took a it took probably took ten years, whereas I didn't think it was going to take that long. I think this is another thing that uh, you know you you could I don't know if you did probably most probably you did, but you could have taken a lot of inspiration from your advisor. I mean Weinberg used to write books just to learn the field. Probably you took inspiration from him uh, in writing Definitely. textbooks. Definitely, no. I, I, you know, I, I aspire to, to, to have that level of textbook. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, for for example, he wrote uh, this textbook on, on um, astrophysics, and I think that uh, yes. that book is much better, at least for me, uh, than many other yes. textbooks on astrophysics. Okay, so I have one question, and then I have some questions that I received from the people when I, you know, you know, announced the, this podcast. So I have one question. I mean, you can answer that in a single sentence, or you can take some more time. So, do you have a favorite interpretation of quantum mechanics? I not an official one. I I kind of think it. It I think of it in a in a kind of a off the streets Bayesian way. It's mm -hmm. it's kind of like a, a special a special. I think of it as being it, the projection of the wave function, all that kind of thing. I think of it as being an, an information. Issue. It's like adjusting your priors, and um, I don't think I've that's fleshed out, or maybe it is fleshed out as a as a as a interpretation, and I don't know it. But I, I, it seems like it avoids a lot of the th things that people worry about. But I don't really think about it too much beyond that, uh, because it's kind of to me it's striking that nobody has needed to understand that <laughs> it hasn't been an obstruction to physics uh, that interpretational mm -hmm. issue, and so. Um, it doesn't seem that pressing to me. Okay. So, uh, but but you said that you like the Bayesian one. So, cubism? I don't know if it's an official thing. It's it's, it's one of the things that it just seems to me that if I think of, it's like a, it's, I guess what you would have called mm -hmm. a statistical interpretation back in the day. But I, I think see. in the context of Bayesian adjustments of uh, updates, Bayesian updates is kind of what's happening when you're projecting the wave function. It's not like something physical is being projected. It's just you're, you're now have a different ensemble that you're looking at because you now mm -hmm. know more. And I think that's okay. the way to think about it. But I, I, you know, if you push me on 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 any details of it, I can't tell you because I'm not really. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a seat of your pants kind of. <laughs> how, yeah, how I mean, I there think are different. It. There are different interpretations who claim the same thing, but they have differences in uh, some other details. For example, some of the some of them will not consider the wave function as an ontological thing. Some of them will consider it, consider it as an ontological thing. So they have these kind of issues. But I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I have some people's questions. So let me just run through them and then we can end. So the first question is a bit, I don't know if it is a serious question. It's a more like a silly question. So there is this question, uh, the person asks that if quantum fluctuations can lead to galaxies, would my accidentally knocking over a wine glass potentially lead to a new planetary system? <laughs> I would I don't say know. no. <laughs> <laughs> you want to answer it. Well, I think it's one of those okay. things that uh, it's probably not a serious question, but I think once you're deep in a potential well, like we are, uh, the fluctuations that gave us galaxies are not those. They're, they're the ones that they were in a very homogeneous background and and mm -hmm. so very different. Yeah. Okay. So the next question is that what's the most compelling evidence supporting the theory of cosmic inflation? Well, that's a good question. So that, that, you know, I think it's probably true that it's not. My answer here probably is not going to be what you would get from most people in, in the sense that, uh, you know, I, I think it's historically it, it was it was it was imagined to be a theory of initial conditions. But I think it's really the fluctuations that have, you know, you came for the initial conditions, but you stayed because the fluctuations, there's a fluctuation generation generating mechanism is really good. And it, and it seems to account for what we see in the sky as far as we know now. But and that's all, and those are all good things. I think that's that's that that's those are good reasons to to um, to like inflation. But I think if you kind of ask, 
what's why inflation as opposed to a bouncing universe or these other proposals that have been out there i think for me inflation um clears a higher bar than they do in the sense that uh, inflation besides being successful and and pretty in many ways it it actually the the the, the mechanism that's that's solving the problems that you're trying to solve is under control in the sense that you it, it, with you, you can you can understand you know, the inflation can be understood in a, in a low energy approximation where all the various corrections and the quantum corrections can be quantified and they're not large. Whereas to my knowledge, at least the things like bouncing cosmologies don't have that property that the, they're always forced to go to a regime that the fundamental thing that's giving you the acceleration re relies on dynamics where you don't necessarily know that the classical approximation is a good approximation. And and so many people don't care. They just say, well, I'm going to look at a classical solution and I don't worry. I don't worry if there's quantum corrections. But I think once you 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 uh, accept the effective field theory perspective that quantum effects are are quantifiable, and that that's a good thing, even if they're small, because it allows you to quantify your theoretical error when you're comparing two observations, then you can't you can't choose to look away because in any situation you have to look at what the quantum corrections are, and it happens that in these bouncing cosmologies they're generically not small. So then, that doesn't mean they're wrong. And, and I think for me, if I were a bouncing person, I would. Focus on that as being the thing that's making those models uh, not as good as inflation, and it's probably solvable, and it, and it might even have been solved. I haven't followed that literature very co closely. Okay, so the next question is that: Can you explain how particle antiparticle pairs created in the early universe influence current theories in particle physics? Also, I enjoy your sense of humor on Twitter, so please compare this to compare this to antiparticle uncle particle pairs. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Is there I some reference a, from your posts? I don't know. No, I think he's making a pun with auntie and uncle, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 yeah you know, okay, I, so, so I think the question that's in there is, is um, you know, people often talk about the, the, the whole inflationary story of uh, scalar fluctuations giving you, at late times, giving you uh, density perturbations that are the seeds on which we now believe there's good evidence that the you know, galaxies have formed from. Uh, you know, you, you can you can now see correlations between where the galaxies are and what the CMB was doing, and which is something you would have to see, given that the fluctuations in the CMB are also fluctuations you're you're seeing amplified under gravity at late times. The fact that that's working so well, you know, gives you confidence that that picture of where galaxies came from is right. And then the question is what the initial conditions were, and that's what things like inflation are providing for you. Um, that that's uh, that's a beautiful thing. It's often phrased as if it's particle production, uh, and I think that's not necessarily the right language in the sense that particle production for me is kind of a more specific thing than just quantum fluctuations. Quantum fluctuations to me would be if you have two operators that don't commute, then if you have a state which is diagonalizing one, then the other one has got a you know there's an ensemble of values that it takes. It's not a fixed thing, and quantum fluctuations to me is just that. So if I look at the energy eigenstates, energy doesn't commute with the electric field, for example, and so therefore the electric field has to be fluctuating in an energy eigenstate like the vacuum. And that's what you're really looking at. That's the sense of which you're looking at fluctuations in these inflationary in systems. It's a field that's fluctuating because it's in an, ener in an energy eigenstate, basically. And it's that's true that that's related to, but it's not the same as particle production. So where you, where you start with a vacuum and it produces later on particles, you can also get that happening in inflation and in time-dependent backgrounds, but they're they're related, but not the same issue, I think. So that doesn't I answer see. the question at all, but I'm using this, I'm using mm -hmm. this as, an, yeah, as yeah. an excuse to make that point. <laughs> right, 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 yeah. Okay, so uh, th there's this question uh, which says that, uh, does the so-called unification problem arise as a side effect of accelerated teaching to newcomers of the successes physics enjoyed in the centuries past? Why could a nature only be just that it promotes big successes of parsimonious mathematical modeling, but not complete ones? I don't know what it, this question actually asks, but did you understand? It's like that a question? philosophical question, so I, I don't think I understand it either. Right. But I do think that you know part of the question, the spirit of it is, you know, why? So why do we have to unify things? And I think that there's probably that's a good point. You know, we don't have to unify things. It, I think it's mostly the the trend to unification has come from the fact that our successful theories have had that property in the sense that, you know, electromagnetism, electricity, magnetism got unified into electromagnetism. That was probably the first one. 
or I guess the first one was was Newton, right? The, the things falling on the Earth and, and and planets orbiting the Sun was the same thing. And and when it, whenever that happens, that's such a beautiful thing where the, the, what were diverse, you know, not related things now are understood in the same way. It's such a compelling thing when it happens, and it happens so often that it's not an unreasonable extrapolation that that will be what happens in the future. But it, you know, who knows? I think you have to. That's an example of something where you're using you're trying to find a clue where you think that I think that's the way things are going to work. So that's what I'm going to think about as opposed mm -hmm. to what's the preponderance of evidence. And so at the preponderance of evidence level, I think it's probably true that there's not, there's no evidence that uh, there's kind of maybe very circumstantial evidence that there could be unification happening amongst the forces that we have. But probably the best argument for that is that the only example we have of a quantum theory of gravity at very high energies, I would say is string theory you know, there may be others, but I think they haven't passed the bar yet. String theorists have passed. And that has the property that it, it it's, it's, a, it's a very unified picture of where all these interactions come from. Uh, and so to the extent you see that as evidence, that, that, that that's uh, evidence that we will continue to see unification happen. But I wouldn't bet the farm. If you could do something interesting without unifying, and it, was, and it made unification impossible, but you could still solve an interesting problem, then do it. <laughs> you know. Yeah, sure. Okay, so there's this question. It says that it would be lovely to hear his opinions about string phenomenology, future experiments, and prospects of string model building. Well, it's a big topic, but if you want to say something yeah. about it, you can. Well, I, you know, in the '80s, it was clear that uh, that inflation was a good good place to start, in the sense that you know, inflation is at very high energies, and you and it in, in a fundamental way involves quantum fluctuations when you're looking at the source of perturbations. And so it means and you're close to quantum effects are small, but they're not uncontrollable. So they're, they're controllable, but they're not so small that you can't see them. So you're, you're you're close to a place, and that's and because of that, that's why you're at high energies, and and that means you're kind of close to the regime where string theory could be the relevant theory to to ask the question because it's just supposed to be describing high energy quantum effects in gravity, and this whole story relies on quantum fluctuations gravitating in an important way, and so a consistent picture of that. String theory sounds like it's the natural place to look. And so many people in the 80s thought, well, we should be looking for inf inflation in string theory. And it turned out to be hard. And so I, I think real progress didn't happen until, uh, you know, 2000 or so, when people started to, the, the problem was always that inflation, you've got some sort of a field that's rolling very slowly. But if you have many fields, as you often do in quantum gravity, then it's not sufficient to have a slow direction, a, a shallow direction in your potential. You have to show that all the other directions aren't steep because if this is shallow, if this direction transverse to it is, is steep, then you're going to roll that way. You're not going to roll this way. And so the hard mm -hmm, part yeah. is always in string theory to find the potential for all the degrees of freedom. So you could kind of say, what's the shallowest one or what's the steepest one when it's still shallow? And yeah. so progress was made with that motivation that you're hoping to get an observational contact um, with between string theory and observations. And I think just having a model like a dilaton isn't telling you a whole bunch. It's mostly inflation's only only sensitive to very uh, coarse grain features, like uh, maybe it's a Goldstone boson for scale invariances. But there were some examples uh, like um, the Joe Polchinski and Rob Myers and Ed Copeland and I'm somebody I'm forgetting somebody else. Yeah, they may, I guess also Henry Tai made the observation that uh, in in a particular kind of one of the first examples of uh, of, of uh, a stringy way of getting inflation was brain antibrain inflation uh, and they they made the observation that 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 same mechanism likes to give you other kinds of things like cosmic strings and so that kind of a thing which is a, not a, more of a stringy uh prediction and not a just a general low energy field theory prediction was an interesting one uh, which you know di didn't wasn't realized, and you know, we we didn't find cosmic strings. But the, the existence of those those kinds of connections uh, is 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 really tantalizing because the inflation is our one window on those energies that are so incredibly high that string physics could be relevant. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I have two more questions from the people, but there is one small question that I forgot to ask. So, what was your reaction when you heard the news that, uh, you know, uh, that uh, vacuum energy is not zero? in the late 90s i didn't believe it <laughs> okay yeah and i, I think that, that particle sense. business most of us didn't believe it but i, I think it's that, that was actually a stupid reaction because because we already had a problem when it was zero right the, the problem was why you know why is it zero and now we had a problem why is it small but non-zero and so the the 
I think it was really an argument from, from ignorance more than anything else. We didn't understand why it was zero. And that made it so repulsive that we didn't think it was going to be even even uglier and it had to be, be non-zero. So I, I think yeah. that that was, uh, the main thing was, I think it focused people's minds that, that there's really something here. There's a numerical value that you have to now understand and the errors in the prediction that you have to understand if you're going to compare it to observations. And I think it's still an open problem. I think it's a, it's a, many people have given up on it as a problem, but I think that that's premature. But I think it's an important problem. And and the discovery of the vacuum of you know the non-zero dark energy helped drive a lot of thinking about it because it really made it a, a more focused question than it used to be. I mean, one of the most remarkable facts that I know is that uh, in 1987, Weinberg gave an actual window on you know this dark energy based on the entropic principle. And when yes. it was discovered, it was in that window. I mean, that's that's a very re remarkable paper by Weinberg. So weren't yes. you a bit more comfortable with this result because of this Weinberg paper, or no. was it still unbelievable? Okay. <laughs> no, I, in fact, I was surprised that I, I it, Weinberg. You know, the story behind that paper was he was going to give a, I think a lecture in Boston, and so he kind of he wrote this this survey paper. Uh, and and the anthropic thing was his part of the the, the in that same paper. There's the no go theorem. Right, right around then, there was a historically people were realizing for the first time that that uh, spontaneously broken scale invariance could have something to say about the cosmological constant because it's it, scale invariance is the one symmetry that even if it's spontaneously broken, it can still make the vacuum energy have to be zero, and so people mm -hmm. were exploring it. People like Christoph Ederich and uh, and uh, Roberto Pache they were looking at models and kind of Weinberg killed a lot of those models with his no go theorem in the same paper. So he's kind of doing a he was doing a, 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 a general big picture story of, of dark energy in that paper, which is a, a very impressive review. I think everybody should read it. But then the um, I think many people found, as you as you just said, they found it very um, sociologically uh, uh, attractive that that he predicted the number with this anthropic argument, and there it was, <laughs> you know. And so that's that's always more it's always more much more convincing to to uh, to predict as opposed to post dict a number like that and yeah, uh, yeah sure. and, and you have to you have to grant him that that he kind of he 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 thought it through and he and he kind of said what what was going to happen um but i think it's you know and i think joel Pachinski, who i also admired very much uh it was interesting to see the two of them as a student because uh weinberg is very much about what's the general thing you can do and Pachinski is very much a what's the simplest example i can think of which captures the physics i'm trying to do and he kind of thinks that through, and 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 it's a very interesting juxtaposition to see them uh, interact with each other. But the, he also, I think, found the uh, the the anthropic argument compelling, and, and particularly once since it had a string, there was a way in which string theory could could uh, you know through the Puso Polchinski kind of mechanism could actually realize it. And uh, I found that, that that I was shocked because both the, I, I admire them both very much, and I and and I admire their effective. Uh, field theory uh, chops very much, and their and their and their their vision of what's important very much, and I and I thought that this anthropic story, which may be true, was a step backward from that because it now the the question is what are the rules and which questions are anthropic and which ones are not, and I think it's good that people thought those rules through a little bit, but I think the uh, my take on what happened was that nobody really came up with a very compelling set of rules, and so I don't see <laughs> that as being a very useful direction in the end of the day. It's it's really it's kind of a set of words you say when you decide I'm not going to try and solve the problem anymore. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, but I don't know if Weinberg's argument. Well, it's called anthropic argument, but is it actually anthropic? I mean, he just said that galaxies should form. Is that actually anthropic? Well, there's probably many things that are called anthropic, and there's there's kind of a one way right. of thinking of anthropic is that just we use the fact that we exist as one of our data points, <laughs> or galaxies exist, right. or whatever the things that we need, and and it's it's, it's certainly anthropic in that sense. But I think there are more mm -hmm. hardcore anthropic, you know, Bay Area anthropic, which is probably uh, stronger than what he would use there. And I think the problem is uh, that if once you start floating all the various parameters, he, he floated one, but you could probably, his his argument wouldn't have been quite so compelling if he floated many of the parameters because his range would have been bigger. And so, you know, it's one of those things where I think history has, the way that things happened has persuaded people in a way that I think if if the ordering of the events had been different, but the outcome was the same, it would have been less compelling <laughs> for many people. Right. 
right right okay so i have two more questions and then we can edit so uh, the one of them is a general question i mean it says that what about physics keeps him hooked to it oh well, it's fun <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know right yeah what what a great gig right you get to think about the 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 what are things made out of what are the fundamental forces of the universe how does the universe as a whole evolve you know well, why would you not do that i mean <laughs> and they pay you <laughs> right i mean if you if you have tenure then you can say it but not before that i mean then it's i mean you have a lot of job insecurity that's the problem but i mean i, I, I don't know true. if the question here yeah Anyway, it depends, well, but it I think depends when, what the question is asking, right? It's, 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 why are we drawn to the field? It's because it's exciting and it's a lot of uh, interesting right, ideas. Right, right. But why you persevere right. in academia is a different question, right? And that's that that's those things you said are true. That there's because it's such an attractive job, many people want to do it, and so then there's a very competitive layer, which is unpleasant. I think that then that's true. That I think whether you think it's right. worth it is a different question. <laughs> Okay, so I think last question. So last question says that what should one oh, sorry what should one focus on as an undergraduate and under as an undergraduate if one wants to be a successful physicist? Well, foundations. So, so uh, mm -hmm. that's I think undergraduate physics programs they're pretty uniform across the world as I, as far as I, I as I understand them. But you know, the, a solid foundation of you know of quantum mechanics and electromagnetism and statistical mechanics and as matter physics. Coming out with that, as you do in a in a good undergraduate program, that's what you need. And I think it's not just for physics. I think that's a good program for doing almost anything. <laughs> you know, you you look at physicists that are all over the place in different subjects in academia, or they're in the they're they're not in academia at all. That the whole mathematical problem solving skill set is unique to physics. I think in the sense that you know the engineers have many of the same. Uh, school skill sets but you're not normally designing bridges from first principles all the time the, the 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 problem you know for good reason the problem from a physicist that the physicist is trying to solve is they're trying to take a, 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 a take a problem that you have in the real world turn it into a math problem then they have the math skills to solve the problem and then taking it back and and seeing what that means in the real world that's such a portable skill that it's 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 hard to overstate how useful it is and so the things that you're learning should be that. So the foundations of how that, where that's worked in physics, but also the portable parts of it, like the how to, you know, being able to code, for example, <laughs> that's super super useful because it's one of the skills, right? And yeah. That, but that that all the things in that mathematical problem solving that is portable, including coding, you have that, and then basically the world is your oyster, and and it may it may include physics and academia, it may not, but it I think it doesn't matter. You know, the I think physicists are overrepresented in interdisciplinary studies because those tools are so useful everywhere and other areas don't learn them in the same way. So you bring a tool set that other people don't have. And uh, is there any advice that you want uh, that that you would want to give to a PhD student who is working yeah, on similar on, fields? Work on what you the problem there is how do you choose your field? And I think if, I guess there's one question is where do you go for grad school? And they're probably going to a place with a lot of depth is, is good because you're often not sure what you want to do when you're starting off as a graduate school. So having a lot of options in the same university is good. But then work on things that you enjoy because the people you're competing with and you're competing and if you if you want to stay in academia, the people that you're competing with are are working really hard. And the ones who are liking it are the ones who are spending the most time at it. And they are the ones that differentially are more successful. So so to the extent that you can choose something that you enjoy so that you will and you'll spend enough time on it that you can be successful. Right. Okay. So it was very, very fun to talk to you. Thank you for your time. Thank you very uh, much. <laughs> I mean, I, I hope that uh, we will have another discussion sometime in the future, but thank you for your time. Uh, yes, thank you.